Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Shaun of the Dead, a British zombie comedy released in 2004. I figured since I just schooled y'all on the origins of the modern zombie by covering Night of the Living Dead, we could take a look at one of the funniest takes on the subgenre, a story about two man-children so driftless in life, they don't even notice when the zombie apocalypse begins. Starring Simon Pegg as the titular Shaun, and Nick Frost as his layabout stoner best friend, Shaun of the Dead was co-written by Peg and director Edgar Wright. This was Wright's first movie, outside of a low-budget 90s western parody, and it showcases the style he'd become known for in his subsequent work. Most notably, fast-paced camera work and kinetic editing, both of which primarily serve as a vehicle for comedy. Shaun of the Dead is sometimes called a horror movie parody, but I don't think that's accurate, nor what the filmmakers intended. Well, we never wanted to make the film into a spoof. We didn't want it to be a, a Mickey take or, a, or in any way irreverent. I would simply classify it as a zombie comedy. It's not doing any satire that wasn't already in Dawn or Day of the Dead, and although it's hilarious, it's also got dramatic moments and sentimental character beats. It all adds up to make Shaun of the Dead a classic, a funny, heartfelt tribute to George Romero that can be enjoyed by horror fans and genre newbies alike. Usual kill count caveat when it comes to horror comedies. This movie's very funny, with a lot of running and recurring jokes. I can't include them all on the kill count. Go watch the movie. I promise you'll be chuffed to bits. One last thing before we get started. This movie is considered the first of the so-called Three Flavors Cornetto trilogy, named after the ice cream referenced in each film. Do you want anything from the shop? Cornetto. The quote-unquote sequels are two stylistically similar films, Hot Fuzz and The World's End, both made by the same filmmakers, Wright, Pegg, and producer Naira Park. I will not be covering those other two movies, however, since they are a comedy action and comedy sci-fi film, respectively. I'm just here for the horror, y'all. And yeah, I know, Mortal Kombat. Bugger off, it's my show. And on my show, I make jokes, give production info, and count bodies. That's a lot to get done, so let's get to the kills. The movie begins with some Dawn of the Dead music that I'm too afraid to play for you because of copyright! A quick fun opening credit sequence shows us soon-to-be British zombies already acting like the undead, snoozing through life and shambling their way up to that title card! 29-year-old Sean is in a fucking rut, and it's starting to wear on his girlfriend of three years, Liz, played by Kate Ashfield. All he ever does with her is go to this pub, the Winchester, and his best friend Ed is always around, preventing any privacy. Just be nice if we could. Fuck. Spend a bit more time together. Bollocks. Ed has a sort of codependency with Sean, which is a source of constant annoyance for their third flatmate, Pete, played by always a highlight comedic character actor, Peter Serafinowitz. Pete's pissed like a pickled pepper, cause Ed still acts like they're in college. But Sean can't help but love his juvenile friend and his smelly fox. Oh. <laughs> oh my god, that's rotten! I'll stop doing them when you start laughing. I am not laughing, keep going. Sean takes a morning walk through his lovely looking neighborhood, which was filmed in North London, around Crouch End. He passes a radio and hears about a satellite returning to Earth, a reference to Night of the Living Dead, where the undead rose due to similar circumstances. This movie's got a ton of references to Romero's work and some other horror films, but I won't be able to point them all out in this kill count. If this episode does well, maybe I'll make a separate video going through them all. Chelsea can join me. It'll be fun. At work, where Sean is an electronics salesman, he's disrespected by his peers, especially 17-year-old Noel, played by Rafe Spall, who was the villain in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Nice glow up, brah. Sean's also got a terse relationship with his stepdad, Philip, who wants him to be a better son to his mother, Barbara. Perhaps you could bring the flowers you forgot to bring Barbara on Mother's Day. I was gonna. And not a cheap posy from a garage forecourt. I wasn't gonna. Because of his personal and familial distractions, Sean fails to notice a few hints that society might be headed for disaster. I won't count random fainting lady here as dead, but I will count this dude with his head immobile on his steering wheel. Seems pretty dead back there. Sean mucks up an anniversary date night by suggesting he and Liz go to the Winchester. It's the last straw for her after a string of disappointments. You promised you'd stop smoking when I did. What? You promised you'd go back to the gym. I... You promised you'd try drinking red wine instead of beer. Well, 
now? It doesn't help that Sean doesn't get along with her flatmates David and Diane either, both played by British comedic series actors, and Dylan Moran, who co-created and starred in Black Books, and Lucy Davis, who played Dawn, aka the Pam Beasley role in the original The Office. She's also Hilda and Sabrina. Liz doesn't want to feel held back by Sean anymore, so she breaks up with him and sends him shuffling home beneath a symbolic spot of rain. Sean finds drunken solace in his best friend Ed and his A1 orangutan impersonation. At the Winchester, named after Ben's rifle at night, by the way, they admire their fellow barflies in the film's only scene with improvisation. The rest of the comedy was tightly scripted to match Edgar Wright's precise filmmaking style. Cocosidal maniac. <laughs> I don't care what Ed tries to invent for pub owner John. Nothing's gonna be as wild as actor Steve Emerson being that middle-aged greaser in the acid trip adventure Bloody New Year. That was one of my favorite kill counts, by the way. Check it out. They leave the pub late, completely pissed, singing Melly Mel and not noticing a meltdown take place next to that TARDIS. A necking couple Sean had noticed earlier, now a neck-eating lady chomping away at her man. They get back to their flat for some fuck -a doodle buffoonery, and it seems like this where the real life friendship of Peg and Frost pays off. They really were flatmates for a number of years, and Frost admits he was a lazy guy during most of that time. Since Frost was a pretty inexperienced actor, production company working title wanted someone else in the role. Peg and Wright insisted on keeping their friend, which was not only good for the movie, but also good for their morale on set. A lot of the behind the scenes footage feels like good friends fucking around. Their hijinks aren't appreciated by flatmate Pete though, and he yells at Sean for his Ed assisted arrested development. Sort your fucking life out, mate. What's up with your hand, man? Pete says he was bitten by crackhead muggers on his way home, but it'll surely be just fine after he gets a little more rest. The next morning, a hungover Sean goes on his morning walk, not noticing that society has seemingly collapsed overnight. I love these long one takes, both this shot and the pre-zombie one it's mirroring. They're so smooth and detailed, and in contrast to each other, hilarious. The walk gives us one more kill as well, when Sean passes a dude dead in his front yard, or whatever British people call front yards. At home, Sean remains oblivious despite some coded channel flipping. As an increasing number of reports of serious attacks on people who are literally being eaten alive. He and Ed find a woman wandering around in their garden, a cashier named Mary who was seen in the opening credits. They mistake her as belligerently drunk and treat it as a big laugh until a Sean shove knocks Mary over and gets her impaled through the back. True to the film's goals of keeping its horror elements horrific, there are some solid effects worked throughout, much of it practical, with some nice CG augmentation when needed. Mary's ability to stand with a see-through abdomen is enough to finally make these deadbeats realize something's wrong. Also a pretty big clue? the fact that a one-armed zombie just walked into their living room. He moans at them until Ed smashes an ashtray over his head, which kills him. Because, as the news reports, head trauma is key to stopping these ghouls. The attackers can be stopped by removing the head or destroying the brain. This line, of course, is lifted nearly verbatim from Night of the Living Dead. The ghoul can be killed by a shot in the head or a heavy blow to the skull. The best friends decide to take Carrie of Mary, and another big boy zombie who's joined her in the garden. They attack them with household items, some albums, but not others. Purple Rain. No. Sign of the time. Definitely not. The Batman soundtrack. Sorry. And finally, most sensibly, a shovel and a cricket bat. Wright and Peg thought it would be interesting to see a zombie problem in suburban London rather than the US, with guns not nearly as available to the populace. Thus, these weapons, which still net the boys to zombie kills when they beat the backlot loiterers to death. Takes them quite a while, but they keep at it until it's done. The man on their telly says to watch out for bite victims, causing them concern about their flatmate Pete. And he's not the only one they know who's been bit, as Sean learns on a phone call with his mom Barbara. Mom, have you been bitten? No, but Philip has. Oh, okay. Knowing the danger Philip now potentially presents, they say they're coming over. No ifs, ands, or buts. We are coming to get you, Barbara! And in case you were ignorant of that reference, it's one of the most memorable lines from Night. They're coming to get you, Barbara. In one of the film's best-known sequences, Sean formulates a plan visualized in Edgar Wright's snazzy style. After a few revisions, he inevitably lands on a rescue mission that ends with them safe at his favorite pub. Grab Liz, go to the Winchester, 
have a nice cold pint, and wait for all this to blow over. Before they leave, Sean has a wee and finds a zombified Peter in their shower. He died at some point, and since he was an established character, I'll count his zombie appearance as a kill. Sean and Ed flee their tall, naked zombie flatmate, and all the other undead ghouls outside trying to get him. And they are, in fact, the living dead, as the radio confirms. The first part of their master plan is picking up Sean's mum Barbara, a delightful woman with a delightful nickname for her son. Hello, Pickle. The role of Barbara was originally offered to Helen Mirren, but I'm glad it ended up being Penelope Wilton. She's great. Sean finds his stepdad Phil, looking pretty ill, but just as alive and as surly as ever. Bill Nighy's another great addition to this cast. I love how Philip is constantly disappointed in Sean, but there's a layer of sympathy beneath it all. On their way out, Philip gets bitten once more, forcing him to hand over the keys to his beloved Jaguar, which Ed insists on driving recklessly. He speeds them on over to Liz's place and drops Sean off to get his ex. Just a note, I won't be counting zombie head blacks like these. They aren't brain destroying, as far as I can tell. Sean climbs through Liz's window to ensure that she's safe inside. He shows off the new Sean by saying he's here to rescue them and tells her and her flatmates how to survive outside. You get cornered, bash him in the head. That seems to work out. Although David's a pissy boy, who poo poos the plan, the ladies are persuaded, and so out they go, bashing many a zombie head along the way. They cram into Philip's car, where Barbara and Liz meet for the first time, and Ed takes off like a jag out of hell. During the drive to the Winchester, a dying Philip laments to Sean that it's not easy being a father, and that he always loved him as his own real son. It's an emotional moment, deftly played straight by Nighy and Peg, and shows that this movie isn't content with only getting us to laugh. After his apology, Philip turns into a a zombie, scaring everyone out of the car before he can successfully bite any of them. Surrounded by zombies, and this one background body I'll count lying beneath this car, Sean insists that they continue to the Winchester on foot, since Phillip's no longer allowing them to use the Jaguar. On their way, they see zombies eating the corpse of Snake Hips, a guy from the Winchester who reminds me of Rockabilly Jim from the Great Pottery Throwdown. I like how Ed had mentioned Snake Hips was always surrounded by women, a fact that remains true even in death. As Liz is telling Sean that they're still broken up, their group runs into Sean's friend Yvonne, leading her own band of survivors. Yvonne was shown in an earlier scene and is played by Jessica Stevenson, who co-created, co-wrote, and co-starred in the British sitcom Spaced alongside Simon Pegg. Spaced, which featured Nick Frost in his first ever acting gig, was also directed by Edgar Wright, and an episode titled Art actually led to Shaun of the Dead. In it, Pegg's character hallucinates a zombie fight thanks to Resident Evil and some cheap street speed. After shooting that sequence, Edgar and I were like, wow, oh, it'd be great if we could make a zombie film, wouldn't it? Like our own zombie film. It could be like about just us, you know, like what would happen if it happened to us? And that's how it was born. Peg and Wright spent years writing and developing the script for Sean, trying to make the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to Dawn of the Dead's Hamlet. Even after all that prep work, though, their film crew was initially skeptical of the film's prospects. One of the zombies in makeup came up to me thinking that I was a runner and just looked over at me and went, Phew, straight to video for this one. <laughs> Yvonne's band of followers includes Martin Freeman, then known from The Office, where he played Tim, the British version's equivalent to Jim Halpert. In fact, Yvonne's entire group is played by recognizable British comedic actors, but the only one I know is Matt Lucas in the back there. He was in Bridesmaids and a co-presenter of Great British Bake Off. The two friends wish each other luck and leave in opposite directions, giving us a funny sight gag when we see that their groups are doppelgangers of each other. While hopping garden fences, Sean's crew passes a house with a dead body inside. There's also a zombie inside, which distracts Barbara and gets her left behind. Sean finds her on the ground and then fights with the zombie and PJs, and with some direction from the ladies, pins the feller to a tree. Feel free to step in any time! You do alright? I didn't want to crap your style. Their path to the Winchester is obstructed by a zombie block party, which triggers another winch fest from Harry Potter or David. His moaning gives them the idea to get past the horde by pretending to be part of it. They're prepped for their performance by Diane, who it had been mentioned earlier was an out-of-work actor. With varying commitment, they put on their show. And these thespians do well enough to pass through the swarm of zombies, most of whom were played by fans of Spaced who did this background work for a single pound. They get to the Winchester and find it locked, and when Ed breaks zombie character to answer his phone, it's enough to finally set Sean off. I've spent an entire life, look at me, I've spent my entire life sticking my neck out for you, and all you ever do is fuck things up. Fuck things up and make me look stupid. 
Well, I'm not gonna let you do it anymore. Not today! The argument brings them Zed attention, so David panic riots and throws a trash can through the window. Not wanting the zombies to follow them into the pub, Sean elects to lead the undead on a distracting zombie run, allowing the others to get inside and await his return. David's quick to assume that Sean is dead, and feebly asserts himself as replacement leader. As he's lambasting the larders of the Winchester, though, Sean reappears, just in time for snacks and bromance. Well, I wasn't the one who was blowing our cover by having a tiff with my boyfriend. He's not my boyfriend. I might be a bit warm, the cooler's off. Thanks, babe. The leader once more, Sean flips the circuits to get the TV working and discovers an undead danger waiting for them outside. The zombie horde that chased him, having followed him to the back door. When Ed stupidly makes noise with a video game, it brings attention to their front entrance too. Homeowner John shows up as a zombie, as does his wife Bernie a moment later in the back. David's able to lock Bernie away from them for now, but John's a problem they'll have to deal with. And thanks to a jukebox that kicks on with the power, this zombie fight will be performed to Queen's Don't Stop Me Now. This is another classic scene, rhythmically choreographed. The actors wore earbuds while filming to stay in time with the tune, which is of course one of the most upbeat and optimistic songs you could think of. We just thought it'd be hilariously funny to beat an old man to death to it. Edgar Wright wrote the song into the sequence without even knowing if he'd be able to use it. A quote begging letter to guitarist Brian May got them permission, which honestly worked out for everyone involved. As beloved as it is now, Don't Stop Me Now wasn't always a well-known Queen song. Its inclusion in this film has been credited with bringing renewed attention to it. I've also got to point out that Steve Emerson, who we already knew was a stunt performer, encouraged the cast to wail on him even though he was 70 years old. Gotta love that. The lengthy sequence finally ends when Sean kills Zombie John by shoving his head into the jukebox machine. Although he has a dart in his head now, courtesy of a big miss from Diane, Sean also has a gun, the pub's name sake Winchester. And even if he's not experienced with it, Ed's here to help him avoid getting pedantic internet comments. You know, we've only got 29, 29 bullets. <gasps> The zombies start to break through, and Sean tries to shoot them back with some group assistance. He's not a very good shot. His only kill is one zombie lady he gets with a headshot. It earns them a lull, during which Sean learns a horrible secret. His mom Barbara's been bitten on the wrist by that zombie in pajamas back when they were hopping fences. Sean cries over the tragic fate knocking at her door, while she handles things in a much more stereotypically British way. It's been a funny sort of day, hasn't it? Barbara dies of a zombie bite on the floor of the Winchester, and her death causes an immediate conflict. David wants to dispose of her soon-to-be undead corpse right away, but Sean's not exactly a fan of the idea, and it leads to a multi-way standoff. Sean asserts that David hates him because David's in love with Liz, and although he denies it, his girlfriend Diane says she knows it's true. I've come to terms with that, Dax. Why can't you? Liz shuts down the drama by telling everyone to get a hold of themselves, calming Sean down just in time to confront his zombie mom. Oh man, that's a good way to ruin your favorite watering hole, having to shoot your zombie mom in the head in it. David makes a remark, Sean punches him like he were Harry Cooper, and David actually tries to shoot Sean with the gun. Like, holy shit, he pulled the trigger. It just wasn't loaded. Right. I'm leaving. Yeah, dude, no way you're coming back from that. Also, no way you're coming back from zombies busting through the windows and pulling you outside, a la Barbara from the OG Night of the Living Dead. But David's death visually is more reminiscent of Captain Rhodes in Day of the Dead, as he's torn apart by zombies in a horrifically gory way. Oh, and then his legs are ripped off? This gory death is the best showcase of makeup artist Stuart Conran's work. He filled the fiberglass body with a bunch of fake guts and had Dylan Moran wear it with his real head and arms sticking out. To ensure it came apart correctly, the zombie extras tearing him apart were played by crew members from the prosthetics department. Diane is upset about her boyfriend's death, so she runs outside brandishing his leg as a weapon. I won't be counting Diane as dead though. It's not definitively depicted on screen, and a comic made by Peg and Wright show her surviving the situation by climbing up a tree and napping through the night. I'm now living in Birmingham with my aunt and remain in Christmas card contact with Sean and Liz. Zombies swarm into the building, 
threatening to overrun our three remaining survivors. Sean kills one zombie by shooting her in the head, but that's all he manages to do before they see a familiar naked zombie. Ed successfully puts zombie Pete in a headlock, but the undead flatmate bites his arm, while zombie Bernie returns to nom on his shoulder. Sean watches, utterly horrified, but does get some revenge when he shoots zombie Pete in the head, killing him. Sean, Liz, and a very injured Ed make their way behind the bar, then light it ablaze to keep the zombies at bay. They realize their only way out is the cellar below them, and as they descend, their box of shells explode in the fire, killing three zombies with ricochets that turn into headshots. Down in the cellar, the trio finds themselves trapped, leading to an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. With only two shells left, they begin making plans of suicide. It's done in a way that's both hilarious and depressing, and is the most in love that Sean and Liz have seemed in the movie. Thankfully, by the light of a flame, for one final shared cigarette, they discover a keg lift that'll lead them to freedom outside. Ed decides that he'll stay back, not wanting to slow down the lovebirds, and the two friends have a heart-to-heart, -heart, wherein Sean apologizes for yelling at him earlier, and Ed apologizes for fucking. Oh god, god, that's not funny. Stop doing it when you stop laughing. I'm not laughing. Oh man, that is so sad and sweet. Sean tells Ed he loves him as he and Liz ascend on the lift, popping out onto the street where there are still lots of zombies to deal with. Good thing the army shows up and starts mowing them all down, running over five of them, giving another a door prize, shooting frickin' 18 of them down with their rifles, and hell, that'll even include these last two they thwack in the head, cause they did it with force. Yvonne is here too, and she helps Sean and Liz get to safety. They've survived the zombie apocalypse, and that's enough for them to give their relationship another go. Six months later, life is mostly back to normal, with zombies being turned into entertainment. I won't be counting Zeds we see killed in these shows, though. Give me a break. I've earned it. I will count Noel, since he was a previously established character, now confirmed as dead, or undead. Lots of fun quick bits here showing how society has adapted to zombies. They're used in game shows and are the subjects of benefit concerts put on by Coldplay. Nice that someone's looking out for the undead, even if they're festering skin is all yellow. As for our hero, he lives comfortably with Liz, though she's not the only loved one in his life. Turns out he's keeping zombie Ed as a garden shed friend, chained up in front of a TV so they can still play games together. And that's nice. Did Shaun of the Dead's focus on comedy detract from its body count? I don't think it did, but let's go make sure at the numbers. By my count, there were 51 kills in Shaun of the Dead. 10 were living men, 3 were living ladies, 27 were zombie men, 10 were zombie ladies, and that one corpse under the car? Well, I just couldn't tell. Pretty messy, but makes for a fun looking pie chart, right? With a runtime of 99 minutes, that left us with a kill on average just under every two minutes. I'm giving the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to David, torn apart by zombies. It's so graphic, I can't even show it all in the public version of this video. Doll machete for lamest kill will go to the first victim I counted, the background body in the car. And introduced last episode, I'll give the coolest corpse award for best zombie to Ed. Usually, when a main character gets zombified, it's a tragedy. With Ed, it's almost an improvement. It's a sweet ending solidifying his and Sean's friendship, and like a lot of this movie, is foreshadowed in dialogue earlier on. You wanna live like an owl? Go live in a shed! And that's it. Shaun of the Dead came out in 2004, and George Romero liked it so much, he cast Sean Pegg and Edgar Wright as zombies the following year, when he made Land of the Dead. On Friday, we'll look at the Romero flick whose title was Ape Deer, Dawn of the Dead. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. For the next Kill Count. Attention all dead meat viewers. God. We've got a great deal for you this Friday. One zombie classic, extra blue face. Don't miss this special offer. Come on, <laughs> For one view, you can experience living in the mall during a zombie apocalypse. Come early and receive one free Tom Savini. You'd have to be dead to pass up this deal. And even then, Come by anyway. You'll still have fun. While you're here, enjoy the food court and the world famous blood pressure testing machine. It's to die for. Prepare your shopping list by watching the original Dawn of the Dead, directed by George Romero. And this Friday, watch the kill count on Dead Meat. <laughs>
When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. Dawn of the Dead can sadly only be watched on home video releases due to rights issues. Demi always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this kill count on Shaun of the Dead. I want to thank some patrons like Lynn Webb, Zachary Capone, TJJ, Dylan Butler, Xavier Robinson, and Zoe Pickering. Shaun of the Dead was one of the most requested movies we got emails for. Reminder, those emails really matter, so if you want your request to count, send an email to deadmeatmovies at gmail.com. That's how you wound up with Shaun of the Dead and next Sunday's Kill Count. I'll leave that one a surprise for now. Thanks everyone. Be good people.